Here's the third part of the Knight's Tale. I guess I wouldn't do a good job telling the story if I didn't tell you about the magnificent stadium Theseus built to host a tournament between Arcite and Palamon and their team of knights. The stadium was enormous, circular and made of stone, and was a full mile in circumference and 60 feet high. It also had stadium seating, which meant that if anyone sat in front of you, you could still see the field clearly. There was really no finer stadium in the entire world. There was a white marble gate on both the eastern and western sides of the stadium. Theseus also had altars built on the west, eastern, western, and northern sides of the stadium where he could make sacrifices to the gods. The eastern altar was to make sacrifices to Venus, the goddess of love, while the expensive altar near the western gate was built to honor Mars, the god of war. On the northern side, he built an oratory platform of white alabaster and red coral from which people could address the audience. This he dedicated to Diana, the goddess of the moon and hunting. As I said, the stadium was one of a kind in part because Theseus hired every single mathematician, construction worker, painter, or sculptor in the country. Oh, but I forget. Let me tell you a little bit more about the sculptures and the paintings that adorned the, these three altars because they were truly amazing. Well, first, if you look at the altar devoted to Venus, you'll see paintings of all sorts of people who pers personify everything that love has the ability to make people feel. Pleasure, hope, desire, foolishness, beauty, youth, lust, wealth, magic, power, deceit, flattery, opulence, toil, and jealousy who wore a garland of golden flowers and had a cuckoo bird sit on her hand. The paintings also depicted parties, musical instruments, singers, dancing, happiness, and everything else that had love has the power to create that I don't have time to talk about. There was also a painting of a beautiful Mount Cythria, the home of Venus. There were also paintings of all sorts of people who felt love's pleasure and pain including Narcissus, the man who fell in love with his own reflection, King Solomon, Hercules, the sirens Medea and Circe, fierce Tumus, and wealthy Croesus. So as you can see, no one is immune from Venus's power of love, not even the wisest and richest and strongest men out there. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. The altarpiece was a glorious statue of Venus that depicted her naked, floating in the ocean, so that she was covered from the waist down by green waves that sparkled like glass. She held a string lyre in her hand and wore a garland made of beautiful and sweet-smelling roses on top of her head. Doves flew above her head while her son Cupid stood in front of her. Cupid had wings, carried a bow and arrows, and was blind, just as most other sculptures and paintings depict him. While I'm at it, I should tell you about all the artwork inside the Temple of Mars, too. This temple was decorated with scenes of the horror of war, the same scenes you find in the temple to him in the region of Thrace, where Mars lives. The first scene of the painting on the wall was that of a dark, scary forest on top of a hill that was filled not with people or animals, but with old knotted trees and stumps. You could hear the creaking of the wood and the howling of the wind just by looking at the painting. The painting of a temple dedicated to Mars stood at the bottom of the hill, complete with a statue of the god dressed in a full suit of steel armor and ready for battle. It made him look pretty frightening. The temple gates were gaping, and you could imagine hearing the wind slam them shut. The columns holding up the roof were enormous and made of solid iron. The temple doors, which were made of the indestructible metal adamant, were shut and locked up tightly. The north side of the temple was lit, but everything else was dark. As with the paintings honoring Venus, you could see all the emotions associated with war personified in the paintings in the Temple of Mars. There was treachery, plotting and scheming, anger glowing red, and dread as well. There was the smiling character holding a knife underneath his cape, and a barn burning with black smoke, murder, bloodshed, gaping wounds, misery, blood, knives and piled bodies. You could almost hear the clash of steel and the screams of battle. There was a painting of a man who killed himself, his head lying in a pool of his own blood. 
Death himself stalked another man who had an iron stake poking through his head. Other figures representing personified emotions were nearby too. Misfortune, for example, sat in the middle of the temple looking forlorn, while insanity laughed hysterically. Sadness and outrage were there too, and conquest sat up high in a tower and overlooked the entire scene below. You could see a dead body lying in the bushes with its throat cut, and a thousand dead bodies all piled up, dead from war rather than old age or even disease. There were kidnappers in burning cities and sailing ships, hunters gored to death by their own prey, pigs gorging themselves on little babies lying in their cribs. Mara's servants were there too, including the battlefield surgeon, the butcher, and the blacksmith who makes weapons of war. You could see the scenes of murders of Julius Caesar and the Roman emperors Nero and Caracalla, who had been murdered. Nothing was left out. All the horrors of war were there to see in the paintings inside the Temple of Mars. The statue of Mars inside the temple rode a chariot, and he looked as fierce and angry as ever. The constellations Puella and Rubius, that were often associated with him, shone brightly over his head, and a red-eyed wolf was at his feet, viciously tearing the flesh of a man. The painting was quite amazing, and a true tribute to Mars. And now, as quickly as I can, I'll tell you about the temple devoted to the celibate goddess Diana. All up and down, the walls were painted with scenes of hunting and those depicting chastity. There were portraits of lots of hunters, including Callisto, who pissed Diana off and was transformed into a bear as punishment and later placed in the sky as the North Star. Her son is a star, too. There was a painting of Daphne, whom Diana char changed into a tree. You could also see a painting of Actaeon, the poor hunter whom Diana changed into a deer after he'd seen her naked. The painting even showed his hunting dogs tearing him apart because they didn't realize that the deer was their master. You could also see Atalanta and Maliger, the couple who hunted the wild boar, and many other paintings of other people too, none of which I can recall off the top of my head. The statue of Diana inside the temple featured her sitting on a deer with all her hunting dogs at her feet, as well as the moon. She wore bright green clothes and held a bow and arrow in her hands. Her eyes were pointed towards the ground, towards the underworld. There was a sculpture of a woman crying out for mercy in the middle of a childbirth next to the statue of Diana. The artist who made these sculptures and paintings really knew how to make scenes come to life, and you could tell they spared no expense in the creating of the altar. And when the stadium had finally been completed, Theseus felt pretty happy with the results. But before I take any, talk any more about him, let me switch gears quickly and tell you more about our site in Palamon. Well, the day of the tournament came very quickly, and our site in Palamon assembled their 100 battle ready knights in the new stadium in Athens. Got a tournament fought for the love of a woman. That would definitely be a sight to see now, wouldn't it? Lots of Athenians said they never had so many of the world's most noble and valiant assembled in one place for such a tournament. Knights had come from far and wide and applied to fight for our site in Palamon, but only 200 men were chosen to participate. Well, you know yourself that if it was announced that this kind of tournament was going to be held tomorrow, they're either here in England or somewhere else, every knight who ever dreamed of honor and glory would come out of the woodwork to get a piece of the action. Well, the knights who fought for Palamon felt this way, too. They all wanted to prove their honor. Some came dressed in chainmail, a tunic, and a breastplate. Others simply wore a couple of steel plates, one on the front and one on the back. Others carried a simple round shield or made sure to wear leg armor. Some wanted to fight with mace, while other knights brought axes. Each person came with the armor and weapons he thought would help him win. Lysurgis himself, the powerful king of Thrace, came with Palamon. He looked so manly with his jet black beard and his hair that fell down to his waist. The pupils of his eyes were somewhere between red and yellow. Those eyes and his big bushy eyebrow made him look like a griffin, half lion and a half eagle. He had broad shoulders and strong muscular arms. He wore an enormous black bear skin over his armor instead of a tunic and its yellow claws shone like gold. A crown of gold studded with diamonds and rubies glittered on top of his head. Like most Thracian warriors, he arrived in a golden chariot pulled down by four white bulls. Twenty giant white wolves circled around his chariot, tethered with gold collars and muzzles. 
he brought with him a hundred of his own knights 